Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to the show. We hope to talk to you live today. This is a call-in show, so if you would take a pen, write down our number. It's eight, It's 979 845 5689 845-5689 or if you would like to email you can email me at gardensuccess at t-a-m-u dot e-d-u it's always a better show when you are uh, calling in and because a lot of people will have the same question that you do uh, some people are just a little shy about calling in so uh, we hope that you will join us uh, talk about a couple things going on here uh, around the area tonight, September 1st, 6.30 p.m., the uh, program Texas Tough Natives for Drought and Flood, put on by the Post Oak Chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas, will be uh, available online. It's it's not a live drive-to-it program. It's a live online program. And so, again, here's that need for a pen and paper when you're listening to garden success i'm going to give you the url the the website link where you go and you can participate online it's tiny url t-i-n-y url dot com and then a slash and frog fruit one word frog fruit all right uh let's see let's go and go to the phones right now to start off and talk to krishna hello krishna yes hi thank you very much for taking my call yes sir um, I live in College Station, um, and I've noticed that there is quite a bit of what I think is the cinch bug um, problem on my lawn. Mm-hmm. Um, there's large patches of uh, places where the lawn's dead. Yes. And do you know what I should do at this time of the year to deal with that? Okay. Uh, Krishna, as you look at your lawn, is the spots where it started, the dead spots began, is it next to a driveway or a sidewalk or a curb side? Yes. Or is it out in the lawn? Um, Quite a bit of it is close to the driveway. Okay. Well, it's possible that it could be chinch bugs. This is the time of year when we see our, our most serious generation of that insect uh, but having said that i've yet to get a chinch bug sample in at the extension office so uh, while it very well could be it's not the first thing i would think of the first thing is drought uh, the trying to keep up with watering and things like that if you feel like you really have done the necessary watering to keep the lawn healthy and it's dying like that, then we probably are looking at chinch bugs. But most of the lawns I see around town, it's a water issue. So, okay. okay, so you go online, uh, just do a search online for a uh, chinch bug and uh, look at what, do an image search, look at what they look like. They're little black and white insects when they're adults. Uh, and uh, they're very small, maybe, I don't know, an eighth of an inch long, something like that. And when they're younger, they're more like a uh, kind of a reddish uh, orangey color. And they may just have the bugs that color and then there's a white band across the back. But once you go online and look at the image and know what you're looking for, and then just remember this is something that's half the length of a grain of rice, uh, then go down in your lawn to the zone between healthy and dead because that's where the chinch bugs will be actively feeding. You know, the dead grass isn't going to give them any sustenance, so they're moving out into the healthy. And if you get down on hands and knees and part the grass and look right at the surface, kind of part it and hold still for a minute and watch, you'll see them crawling around. If there's enough chinch bugs to be killing the lawn, they'll be pretty visible. Uh, There's other ways to go about it. You can take a sample of your lawn uh, in that same zone. Uh, I would do two or three samples, maybe four inch by four inch. Put them in Ziploc bags and take them to the AgriLife Extension office, and I can take a look at them uh, carefully there and identify if that's the problem. And if you take the sample in the zone between healthy and dead, uh, I can identify it for you. Uh, Before you go out 
you know, spraying an insecticide, I think we need to be really, really sure this is what's causing the problem. And, and if it's a case, we can recommend some good controls. Thank, thank you so much. That's extremely helpful. Thank All you. All right. Well, look forward to maybe getting a sample. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. All right. Uh, number 845-5689 or garden success at tamu.edu. That's the email. All right, so we talked about the uh, program uh, tonight for the Native Plant Society. Uh, there's also, we're hitting the time coming up here where the um, Horticulture Department is having their annual pecan sale, pecan kernel sale. Uh, these are pecans that are harvested from the Texas A&M University Pecan Orchard uh, just out across the Brazos River, out if you take University Drive out that way, you'll you'll come real close to it. It's it's on the road down uh, to the left as you get out there across the river. But uh, they don't sell them there. They sell them uh, here on campus. And you pick them up at the Horticulture Sciences main office, and that is room 202 in the Horticulture Science building, every Tuesday through Thursday in August. And so ooh, we just got through with that. I don't know if they're still selling them or not. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a phone number that you can call. I'm sitting here reading the advertisement and then realizing it's just passed. Uh, call the main number at 845-5341 and see if they still have pecans for sale. Uh, that would be the best thing you could do at this point in time. But those are always great pecans uh, coming out there from the, the um, I guess you could say they're Aggie pecans, so they have to be better, right? Okay, uh, other things going on uh, in the area. Uh, the uh, Jennifer Nations, the folks at the Water Department here in College Station, uh, are having a Grow and Go Box garden kit sale. So what you do is you order the Grow and Go Boxes, and then you pick them up on September 17th. Uh, and so these uh, particular boxes are, have been put together by some folks up in the Dallas area that are part of a agri used to be part of our AgriLife Water University program. And uh, they're going to have all kinds of plants that are well adapted uh, for certain types of gardening. So, for example, maybe you want a plant that is a um, um, has native plants in it or a selection. So this would include things like Greg's Mistflower and Autumn Sage and Flame Acanthus and Landsleaf Coreopsis and on and on. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I think eleven or twelve plants in there uh, that you can grow. It's called a grow and Go and Grow Garden. Uh, so anyway, lots of different starter plants, three-inch pots, and you get the whole flat uh, with the, with your price. Now, if you want if you want to find out more about the particular kinds of plants that they have, they have they have a group that's for a shade garden. Uh, they have a group that's for a pollinator garden. Maybe that's what uh, uh, you're interested in. Uh, so what what you need to do is uh, let's see, get the right connection here. I'm trying to find it. Uh, I guess you would go to um, contact the um, Water Department. Uh, the uh, office number there is 979-764-6223, uh, or you can go to CSTX, College Station, Texas, cstx.gov slash water, uh, and find out more information uh, on those. But that the pickup, you go ahead and order them. But the pickup will be on September 17th, which is just around the corner, so don't delay. Hopefully they still have some of those available that you can get. And if you're listening from the Water Department and want to give us a call and correct anything on that, please do. Uh, or you can just call me and talk about them, how wonderful those plants are. Uh, let's see, I'm going to talk a little bit about vegetable gardening. We, we are in that time when we transition from summer gardening to fall gardening. And it, it hasn't it been strange? You know, we go like three months and it doesn't rain a drop. And then all of a sudden, uh, what is Easterwood now? Probably well over four inches of rain in the last, in the month of August. But I can tell you most of that came at the end, of, toward the end, the middle to end of August. Um, and now we're looking at temperatures, you know, that may make the mid-90s. And uh, boy, what a change. Uh, and so that transition is not one that I expect to be, you know, permanent. It's very unusual to, to not also be hot well in, into and even through September, uh, it can be. But uh, now's the time when we start planting the cool season 
vegetables. Not all of them, but uh, for example, uh, if you want to grow beets or if you want to grow Swiss chard, that's not a winter vegetable, but it does it does okay uh, in the cooler season as long as we protect it from freezes. Uh, this is a time when turnips uh, also can go in. Uh, radishes can also start to go in. By the time we hit mid-September, that's when we really start planting the cool season garden. And it begins with the cruciferous vegetables. We call them coal crops. Uh, another way to look at it is those the blue-leafed vegetables, that blue-green leaf of broccoli and cabbage and kale and cauliflower and kohlrabi and uh, to say collards, uh, there's some others. Bus Brussels sprouts, another good one. That all starts to go in here, ideally, in uh, mid-September as transplants. You can plant earlier. You can plant from seed, and you can also uh, start transplants or plant transplants a little earlier. But in general, it gives us a good fast head start uh, to use those kinds of uh, plants. That that takes us all the way. Really, those those plants can be planted all the way into early November. It's better to get it done earlier because when even though they can take a freeze, they grow best when temperatures are mild, not hot, not freezing. And so we got to get them in and get them started so we get a good harvest. Uh, by the time we get into October, we start to pick up things like uh, carrots, uh, for example. Uh, garlic uh, can go in at that time, and lettuce uh, begins when it. W it's best to get a good cold front in here or something close to it. And so we say, you know, about the second or third week of October, we start planting uh, the lettuce as an example. Uh, if you've got uh, bulbing onions that you're going to plant from seed, that can be done in late September. I think it's better to probably just buy transplant and do those in January. And uh, the multiplying onions also can go in at that time. So those are just some examples. Oh, spinach. I can't forget spinach. It needs to cool off a little bit, but then we begin in about the middle of October with the, the best time to be getting spinach in the ground. Well, let's, uh, let's stop here on that and go to the phones. Again, the number 979-845-5689. And we're going to talk to David. Hello, David. I was give uh, just a little follow up on your pecan news. Yes, uh, we we got notice, uh, and it was uh, last year's pecans, and they had leftovers. So that's what we were buying, and I'm pretty sure that's what that was about. That was ending in August because I don't think they're really too far along on harvesting for this year. So okay, that that may very well be over with. But it was last year's pecans. They were they're good, uh, but they may be out of those or, or quit selling those by now. But I just wanted you to know that that that's probably what that was about. I appreciate that. Yeah, that that does make sense because it's way too early to have a pecan harvest from yeah. this year. Uh, yeah. We usually get notified here on the station uh, when they're really going to do the this year's crop. You know what I found though? You said they're they're good. It when you f take a pecan and put it in the freezer, it holds the quality really well. Uh, oh, really well. Yes, yeah. uh, it, and I've certainly found from experience that if you don't put them in the freezer, yeah, they're not going to be very good uh, very yeah. long. But, uh, refrigerator, you know, that of course helps too. But freezing, mm -hmm. nothing like freezing them. And yeah, I've, I've had some. My dad used to be a big. Uh, he would get all the natives in shells, sell them by the thousands, and. We found some in the freezer after he passed away that um, that were probably five years old, and they were excellent flavor. <laughs> you know, I mean, and they'd been in the freezer for five years, and they were still good. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, so freezing them definitely works. Uh, and that, you know, I, I, since I got you on the phone, I'll just give you a real uh, – I have a quick question. I think I already sure. know the answer. You hear this all the time about stuff not blooming. Well, I got a Pride of Barbados. It was probably – Mid June, maybe, or even early July, it was decent size, and now it's uh, about six or seven feet tall. Not even a hint of a bloom on it, and it's getting, and certainly during all the heat, was getting midday sun, not really morning and not really evening, but several hours during the day. And I don't know, I just was wondering if you heard much uh, about that or whether you've grown them yourself. I did. It's not the first time I've grown them. The first time I grew one, it, it did well, and then it froze uh, right away. The first winter, it, it, even though I had it kind of mulched, it froze anyway. Uh, down, to, you know, killed it. So, uh, yes. so I'm trying again, but no, no blooms at all. I just was wondering if that's very common, due to your knowledge. You know, it. 
I haven't run across that. And uh, I've got one. I didn't plant it. It was there when we moved in. And it's in too much shade. And every year I think, nah, I need to move that. Uh, and it's blooming. Mine's been blooming. But it's it's in enough shade to where the blooms are nothing to write home about. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some around town blooming. And so, I boy, I don't know why they, you know, it sounds like the growing condition. Number one, if it's six feet tall, you, you obviously have watered it some and, and oh, you yeah. know, kept it going. So I can't. It looks, think. Gr- it looks great, except it doesn't have any blooms. <laughs> well, do you, is it possible that the soil is too rich, too much nitrogen? Uh, maybe it was fertilized or had manure spread around it, or anything else well, that would. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I fertilized it, and I, I, maybe I overdid it. But yeah, I guess again, uh, I wasn't sure that that was really a problem with flowering plants mm-hmm. that they would not bloom. I know that green beans which i've mentioned to you before yes i I put a little too much uh nitrogen and and they just didn't do anything they just all they did was just turn into gigantic vines and no beans so i i really backed off on that although i'm still feel like it does a little good to maybe put a little bit of nitrogen even on beans because sometimes Mm -hmm. the plants just don't look like they're doing much without it uh I know that most of the time the recommendation on beans is no no nitrogen and and so I'm very skimpy. I'll put it that way on the nitrogen. Okay. But no, I, I'm sure it has some nitrogen. I I probably thought well that's not going to hurt it and uh, and boy like I said it looks great if you like green leaves but mm-hmm. uh, but that's that's all I get and so I'm still hoping I'll get something before. It shuts down, but I'm starting to lose hope for this year. Yeah, and I love that plant. Uh, you know, if you go over to oh, San Antonio is a good example. You go over to San Antonio, and they are just beautiful yeah. and covered oh, yeah, yeah. with blooms. And yeah, and there's a beautiful one at the Leach Garden. There's, mm-hmm. there's yes, there is. There. there absolutely is. Uh, the, the, that and the... Um, uh, oh gosh, the other uh, plants' name is escaping me at the moment. But th- I was out the other day, and boy, they're blooming beautifully. So I know they can, and I'm not—I don't want to suggest they don't need it. You know, you should never fertilize them. But I just am trying to think of why would a plant be growing really well and big and not blooming? And I don't have a good answer on on the the that sasal pin. I'm a pride of Barbados that you have. Right, and so, I am going to, of course, try to protect it for the winter so because it's uh, uh i know there there's a good chance they'll come back as long as they're yes protected. yeah i uh i was surprised the year we had well 21 february 21 when we had all the mm-hmm. the incredible freeze i thought well okay yeah. that that kind of plant is gone forever but that little bit of snow cover uh mine came back and oh, wow and it's like okay well that 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 didn't so much impress me at the hardiness of the plant. I knew it's not fully fully hardy, but it impressed me at the value of snow cover over the surface of the yeah, soil right. for underground uh-huh. plant parts. Mm-hmm. So anyway, hey David, right, I, well, I appreciate that call. Thanks for the information on the pecans, and and hopefully we'll get news when the real crop comes out right. or the the okay. current crop comes out. Okay, you bet. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. All right, our number nine seven nine eight four five. Five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or by email at garden success at tamu dot edu. Garden success at tamu dot edu. Uh, see, we got an email from Todd. Uh, several uh, comments, questions in it, but um, uh, I, t- I talked about uh, putting compost down or peat moss down on the yard uh, the other day, and. Let me comment on those a little bit more. Uh, there, Todd had some comments and questions. I think he's planning on trying that. So the the compost, putting compost down. Uh, compost uh, over a lawn as a top dressing uh, is can be a good thing. Now, I wouldn't say that every yard in town needs to have compost every year. That That's an expense. That's a lot of work, and it's not necessary. But I could see a case being made this year when lawns have suffered so much drought and now we have large areas where the grass is either dead or it's kind of spotty uh, with some gaps between it because once the good dense cover of foliage, the grass blades, uh, goes away, the sunlight hits the soil and when that happens, nature plants a weed there. There's weed seeds waiting to grow. And so I can see some lawns starting to struggle with weed problems. So putting down, you know, maybe a half inch uh, 
not too much more than that of, of compost, uh, could help block the sunlight from hitting the soil. It's not a uh, you know a black and white difference, but uh, having a little bit down in areas that are a little bit sparse, uh, it probably is going to help some. Plus, the compost releases nutrients as it decomposes, and so that those are some advantages to doing that. The thing with a peat moss is that there have been a couple of studies uh, by AgriLife Extension over the years that showed a benefit to uh, combating take-all root rot with peat moss. We don't. We need more research to be more positive about, yes, put down peat moss and it'll help you fight, uh, take all root rot. I am not at all at a point where I'm ready to say, yes, do that and make that my recommendation. Uh, but I'm going to be trying some this year. And uh, the, the challenge with compost and peat moss is how do you spread it? And there are little rolling compost spreaders. Just think of them as like a wire cage that as you roll it across the yard, uh, it allows the compost or peat to fall through the holes. And by the way, if you're going to put compost in your yard, you need a very finely screened compost product, not wood chunks that the mower will sling across the yard, uh, but something very finely screened, almost a potting soil-like consistency if you can get down close to that. Uh, but anyway, we're going to try some and see it as a preventative. Here, here's the thing. It doesn't acidify the soil uh, it, it, because our soil, it, we're not going to acidify a high pH uh, Brazos Valley clay soil. Uh, we're just putting a little peat moss on top, even something like sulfur, which is an acidifying product. Uh, on our heavy clays, uh, they are so buffered that it, it doesn't change the pH significantly. But it does change right at the surface. There's something going on there, and we don't know exactly what it is. That take-all is something you find growing on the surface of the runners. It's also, of course, affects and kills the roots. That's where it got its name, take-all root rot. Uh, but the fact that two studies have pointed to some possibility is, is making me want to just give a look at it and see how it does. Uh, but I just want to be really clear that it's not a r current recommendation that that's how we fight uh, take all root rot. Uh, if you're a gambler, if you're an experimenter and want to try something, that, that may be something. But please contact our office if you're going to do that uh, so that we can kind of guide you. And I don't want to give all that out on the radio because, uh, number one, it won't apply to most people. And uh, it, it just sounds more and more like a recommendation as we talk about that. So anyway, uh, that is the compost in the peat. Now, there's a couple of pictures uh, Todd sent us. Uh, one is of okra roots, and the okra roots are all bumpy. In fact, the, you know, uh, the, the problem, and Todd was correct about this, is uh, nematodes in the soil. And you look at the roots, and it's like a string of pearls almost, that uh, all these white knobs on, in the roots, uh, those are nematodes. Uh, okra is not a legume. It doesn't fix nitrogen and nodules on its roots. So that's the only thing that does that to okra is nematodes. And that's a problem for okra. It's a problem for figs. And uh, there are a number of crops that nematodes are susceptible to. But I would say okra would be the probably the favorite of nematodes. Uh, they just really hit it hard. And there are some ways you can combat it. I would, again, rather than going into great lengths on okra and nematodes on the air, uh, give us a call, Todd, and, and let's talk about it or email me at the office and, and let's, uh, let's go forward with some possibilities. We, we don't have a nematicide that you put out in the home garden and it fixes everything. But uh, we can grow crops that trap nematodes, uh, things like uh, cereal rye, not the rye grass that you might overseed a lawn with, but the rye that's a grain that has cereal heads, uh, that cereal rye, and then in the summertime, uh, certain types of marigolds. The nematode goes in the roots, they're not able to reproduce in there, and so it, it slowly is lowering down the populations rather than building them up. You grow something they like year after year, and you have wall-to-wall -wall nematodes in the soil. And so we want to we want to rotate away from those. And one of the best things to rotate away with is a, trop, a trap crop that works. There are other things we can do uh, to help reduce nematodes. There's even products on the market that claim it. Uh, I've done testing on those and so far have not found one that seemed to work. Uh, when I used them according to the label, we didn't see a significant change. That's not saying there's no benefit to them. It's just uh, we need some good research uh, that's unbiased. In other words, we're not selling the product. We're, 
we're just doing unbiased research on it uh, to point to that because they are a problem, especially in sandy soil, but they can occur in other types of soil as well. There's also a picture of a tomato with a brown spot at the bottom of the stem. That is some sort of a lesion, and I see a little bit of white, so I'm starting to wonder if maybe uh, southern um, blight is not uh, occurring down there at the base. That's a disease that is it just absolutely kills the tomato plant. Uh, it has some other symptoms, uh, but again, give us a call at the office, and, and we'll talk about that one a little bit further. Good pictures, by the way, Todd. Those it makes it so much easier to uh, to try to diagnose. Uh, let's see. Someone had, had asked. I've talked about in the past bringing in turf samples to the extension office for a diagnosis, identifying things. Uh, and someone asked, how big of a sample do you need? Well, in general, uh, a four by four inch plug, or you could make it a four by six inch plug. Slip it into a plastic bag, could be a big zip clothes bag or, or something else, uh, and you want to take it, and this is the most important part, in the zone between healthy and dead. Because if it's chinch bugs, that's where the most chinch bugs are going to be found. If it's uh, a disease such as a take-all root rot that I was talking about, that's where I can best see the, the fungal strand signs on the runner uh, of it. Put it in the bag, zip it up, that way nothing escapes, that way the, ba the sample doesn't dry out, and take it to the AgriLife Extension office with name, uh, phone number, and email, because we may end up attaching a fact sheet uh, with the answer. Now, it's, as long as, as we are able to get to those, we'll, we're glad to do it. There's also a plant clinic on campus, the state plant clinic, where you can take any kind of sample. They're able to take things to a higher level. Uh, I can tell you for chinch bugs and take all, I can see it on there. At my, myself at, at, in my office, uh, on my office um, mic microscope, but uh, you can always go the route of the uh, clinic. Uh, they, of course, cover the whole state, and so inundating them with every home uh, disease question in the world would, would be a little, probably not a good idea, uh, but uh, they are there, and that is a service that's available, and you certainly can use that. And when I can't identify something, that's who I, I look to. Uh, for help with that, because they're the professionals uh, at doing it. Okay, let's see. We've got a question. Let me go back to the emails here. Uh, someone built a raised bed, and they uh, mixed 50% topsoil, 50% mushroom compost, and everything did good, but I think I may have talked about this one last week. The turnip greens were huge, and the turnips' roots were very small. And that's true of root crops in general. If you plant radishes, if you plant turnips, if you plant beets, uh, let's see, if you plant carrots, and uh, there are several things that cause them not to develop roots. One is too much shade. Roots on these root crops are full of carbohydrates, and you need a lot of sunlight hitting leaves to make the carbohydrates. And so as you go away from full sun into more and more and more shade, your productivity goes down. The second thing is, is excessive nitrogen that pushes them toward a lot of top growth at the expense of root development. Now, it doesn't mean they don't need any, it just means you can overdo it. And I think 50% topsoil, 50% mushroom compost, that may be what's going on with those turnips. The other thing is crowding. Uh, when you crowd these crops, they don't develop roots as well. And so I always say look at what you, consider what the mature root should be. Like if it's a if it's a carrot, you know, it's going to be inch, maybe inch and a half uh, across when it's its ideal full size. So you would never want your seeds to be closer than that. They could be, you know, inch and a half or two inches apart in order to make sure you get a good development. That's some spacing. So with a beet, it would be, have to be wider spacing and a turnip even wider spacing. And so those are just some examples of things that can cause a root crop. Root crop to not develop. Uh, somebody better call pretty quick because I am stumbling over my tongue here today trying to <laughs> say say words. Our number 845-5689-845-5689. Uh, you want to go on and uh, uh, someone is uh, t talking about uh, collecting seeds from oaks and planting them and uh, can you do that and how do you do that? Well, uh, first of all, oaks are extremely promiscuous, and the pollen floats on the air. 
And so if you've got several kinds of oaks nearby, the oak you, seed you collect may be of mixed parentage. So it may not, not, not all oaks cross, but that can certainly happen. And it makes it, it makes it hard sometimes to get a pure seed source. But just be aware of that. Secondly, oaks, like many things, go through kind of a winter cool wet period that is part of the natural cycle of the year. And in doing that, it helps that plant in terms of actually germinating and growing. And so I will often collect acorns and put them in, well, first of all, take them and put them in a bucket of water, drop them in a bucket of water, and anything that floats, throw it away. There's weevils that get in them and eat the insides, and it becomes a little buoyant acorn, and that's not going to ever sprout and grow. Uh, take the ones that, that are denser than that and put them in moist sand or moist peat moss in a zip closed bag or a jar in the refrigerator. After about a month, take a, take a look at them and you may see some little roots already starting to emerge. If not, leave them another month. And then take them out and plant them and they'll sprout and grow much, much faster. And so that would be how you would go about uh, growing your own oak tree uh, from an acorn. Just remember, depending on the specific type of oak, uh, you may end up with something a little different than the tree it came off of. Well, let's go back to the phones now, the number 845-5689, and talk to Jesse. Hello, Jesse. Yeah, hello. Listen, I, I had I got in late, so I don't know if you've talked about this already, but I lived in one of the areas of town that was not allowed to irrigate and had significant portions of my yard die due to lack of irrigation. I was able to soak or hose some parts right around the house, but I'm worried now that we're getting rain that I'm going to have mud where I have dead grass. Yeah. Is there any quick solution like putting overseeding ryegrass in the winter till the, the St. Augustine survivors start spreading next spring? Or what solutions do you have for those, uh, those of us yeah. who lost significant portions of our yard due to the drought and lack of irrigation? Yeah, g good question. Um, so it, there is still time to put on sod. And if you know you've lost an area, you could go ahead and do that and get the sod rooted in very well before before winter. As we go closer and closer, uh, you know, to the first freeze, there's just not a lot of time for it to root in really well. Uh, but that is one option. Uh, another would be to use something like a compost covering over there to just kind of coat the soil, keep the weed seeds down, and so on. Doesn't really help a lot on the mud problem, and uh, I would definitely reroute any foot traffic from those areas where there just isn't grass anyway. Uh, the overseeding is done later. Uh, it's it's too hot and too early to do that now. But as we get into probably October time, uh, putting down some some overseeded rye would work. Uh, you can use, uh, sometimes we use a mix of annual and perennial rye. And if you'll contact me at the office where I have my files, I can give you the specifics on that. Uh, but the annual rye comes up fast, but it tends to not be as dark green and as good of a grass as the perennial rye does. Uh, the The problem with rye is it's like you're putting weeds in your yard. If you were to talk to the St. Augustine, it, it's just another weed that's competing with me for light and nutrients. And so during that springtime transition, when the St. Augustine is trying to wake up and start growing, the ryegrass is growing strong and you're having to mow regularly and really kind of watch it. Uh, and it, it stresses the grass and it, it, it's a competition for it. Now, as it heats up more and more, the grass takes over and the rye goes downhill. But that's the negative of it. And we've seen, especially on um, Bermuda grass uh, lawns and golf courses and things, that when you overseed every year, uh, it, it you can have some decline in the performance of, of your of your turf grass. Uh, so that would be the trade-off, I think, Jesse. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good Good luck with that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689. And uh, we're gonna, let's see, I wanna go and talk a little bit about things going on around town uh, on uh, tonight, uh, 30, uh, September 1st, we talked about the post-oak 
uh, chapter of the Native Plant Society program, Texas Tough Natives and Drought. That's that online program. Uh, and then on the 15th of September, the Brazos Valley Orchid Society meets from 7 to 9 p.m. So that's two Thursdays from now, 7 to 9 p.m. at Fire Station Number 6 at the corner of Tarot and University Drive, the Brazos Valley Orchid Society. Of course, that's a free meeting. And you can go pick the brains of some orchid folks and learn a little bit more about orchids. Maybe bring some of yours uh, to show them and get some ideas for tips for taking care of them. On Tuesday, September 20th, the Texas A&M uh, Women's Club Garden Interest Group. They call that the GIG, G-I-G, Garden Interest Group, uh, from 9.30 to 11.30 at the Bush Presidential Library. And the program is Gardening for the Wildlife You Want and Don't Want. Uh, Katie Krause, a Walker County Master Gardener, uh, will lead a discussion on how to deter animals and insects that destroy your garden but continue to attract uh, pollinators. And so that's uh, one that you're welcome to attend Thursday or t Tuesday, September 20th, 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 at the George Bush Presidential Library. Then on the 27th, our Brazos County Master Gardeners are going to be having a program at 7 p.m. at the Extension Office. Uh, and Daniel Hoffman uh, with Trophy Fisheries will discuss garden ponds, construction, features, and maintenance. Everyone appreciates water features, especially uh, during the summertime, uh, and you will learn how to introduce one into your landscape. So it's free and available to the public uh, Tuesday, September 27th at the AgriLife Extension Office. So if you want to learn about garden ponds, uh, how they're built, uh, some of the features of a pond, how to maintain a garden pond, this will be a great opportunity to come and learn that. Okay, let's see. On um, on Saturday, September 17th, I'm kind of going back back uh, earlier in time here, uh, but at 10 a.m., the Brass County Master Gardener uh, are going to have a program on wildlife photography for the backyard nature lover. Jim Miles, one of our Master Gardeners, is going to be uh, talking about uh, some camera tips on how to do wildlife photography for those of you who would love to be uh, photographers for your backyard nature enjoyment. And so that's the Learning at the Library series at the Clara Mounts Library, 26th Street in Bryan, 10 a.m. Saturday, September 17th. Another free program available to you. Then on Sunday, September 18th, uh, uh, Jim will be also speaking on wildlife photography out at Lick Creek Park. And that's at 3 p.m. Sunday, September 18th. And he's going to talk about wildlife photography for the backyard nature lover. Same kind of information. Now, the programs at Lick Creek Park, they charge for that, and that would be a $4 per person fee. And you have to go to the College Station Parks and Rec website uh, to register for that. I want to remind you that we still have um, the farmers markets that go on around town. If you're new to the area, uh, we've got the Brazos Valley Farmers Market on Saturdays downtown on Main Street in Bryan from 8 a.m. to noon. There's all kinds of wonderful things to eat there. There's usually a food tr or t truck or two set up uh, for, for lunchtime and, or for some snacks and, and food. Uh, then on um, Tuesdays from noon to 5 at the corner of University and Glen Haven in College Station, that's uh, next to the, or across the street from the Scott and White Clinic. Uh, there's a farmer's market, the South Valley, South Brazos County Farmer's Market. And then uh, the South Brazos County Farmer's Market also meets at the same location on Fridays from noon to five. The, the um, South Brazos County Farmer's Market. Uh, lots of good things that you can purchase there. Then there's a Farm Fridays uh, out on uh, FM 974, which we call Tabor Road. Uh, there's a new farmer's market out there offering locally grown produce, plants, eggs, dog treats, blanket, hand knotted blankets, oh my gosh, all kinds of things. Uh, and that's Farm Fridays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. out at 2861 FM 974. Lots of stuff going on out and about. Oh, by the way, too, uh, if you haven't been out to the uh, Demonstration I Idea Gardens lately, 
The Brazos County Master Gardeners maintain those out on Highway 21, where our old office used to be, and we call it the Demonstration Idea Garden, or the DIG, D-I-G, uh, and it's a chance to kind of walk through and see what's thriving and what's going on there. Occasionally, there'll be Master Gardeners out working in the gardens, and uh, you may get to visit with some of them uh, and find more tips for gardening successfully here, but those are open and free to the public to wander through any time you like. Uh, on uh, the gardens on campus uh, is another wonderful opportunity. Uh, beautiful gardens that have been developed on our campus. They are open uh, from dawn to dusk out there uh, behind the Ag and Life Sciences building. Uh, so it, I encourage you to go check them out. If you want to see the website, it's gardens.tamu.edu. Gardens .tamu.edu. You can learn more about it. They've got some events coming up, a real, a real cool um, a garden a fall festival uh, coming up in, in October, and I'll tell you more about that as we get a little bit closer to it. But anybody can walk through out there dawn to dusk and just see some beautiful stuff. I was out just the other day, and I'm really impressed with a lot of the blooming things. I mean, it's amazing after this summer we had that anything is alive, right? And yet they're thriving out there, well taken care of, and and doing really well. There's a little vegetable garden area. There's flower garden or a little herb area. Uh, just uh, a, gr a grape vineyard out there as well. Lots of different kinds of trees that have been planted and uh, very enjoyable uh, to get out and check it out. Uh, going to the emails, uh, by the way, our phone number is 845-5689 or by email gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Kimberly sends me a picture of basil plants that have holes in the leaves. And uh, there's also some little black, uh, little tiny black pellets on the leaves also. And so we're going to play Who Done It here. And uh, those, those are caused by a caterpillar. And the pellets, or basically, we, we say caterpillar frass because uh, frass is a nicer word than what that really is. Uh, but <laughs> it's, uh, the, those are the pellets produced after the caterpillar eats the leaves. And so uh, that's a sign that you've got caterpillars. Now, it's interesting, and I know that um, we just, uh, you know, are in the big middle of lunchtime here, but I'm going to go ahead anyway with this. Uh, there is actually a science to entomological, um, uh, let's see, brass <laughs> information. Beetles and caterpillars and other insects all produce different kinds of droppings after they feed on your plants. And so when, when I look at holes in a leaf, I could say, well, that's probably a caterpillar, but it could be a beetle. It could be a slug or snail feeding on the leaf. It could be a grasshopper feeding on the leaf. Those all eat leaves. Sometimes the way they eat the leaf is eaten gives us a little bit of clue. Uh, but, but the frass, the droppings, are one of the easiest ways to know exactly what we're dealing with. Uh, with things like grasshoppers, they can fly away. Beetles can fly away. Uh, unless they're in the larval stage. Uh, but caterpillars are kind of stuck. So if you go looking around the plant, you're probably going to find them. Uh, some types of caterpillars will be un just uh, underneath the mulch cover, hiding during some parts of the day. Some types are nocturnal. Uh, but you get to kind of put on your Sherlock Holmes cap and grab a pipe and, and, and go be the detective in the garden uh, to determine these kind of things. But that's what it is. So on something like basil, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I mean, if, if it's bad enough, you could spray a little Bacillus thuringiensis, which is BT, on there. Uh, but I'd also always look at the holes that have been chewed and the edges of the holes. When anything wounds a leaf, including you clipping it off with a pair of scissors, uh, the edge, when it's fresh, is going to be a nice fresh wound. Uh, but after a day or two or three, you start to see the little browning and the drying of the edge where, it, where the wound occurred. And when you see that and you don't see fresh wounds, that caterpillar, in this case a caterpillar, has probably pupated and it's going to become a butterfly and go off somewhere else. Uh, and so that wouldn't be a time to spray B BT. It would do no good at all. Uh, if it's just a little bit of holes in the leaves, I ignore it. Plants can take a lot of foliage damage before there is a significant injury to the plant. 
So if I were using the basil, I would pick off those leaves and just use the fresh leaves. If it's too much, spray it with a little Bt if you can find the, the pests. Keep in mind that Bt, although it's, it's organic uh, and very, very safe from a toxicity standpoint, uh, as the caterpillar gets older, it, the Bt is less effective in shutting it down. Uh, the young, voraciously feeding caterpillars, Bt is just, it, it hammers them well. Uh, but when a caterpillar gets older, maybe it's starting to think about becoming a pupa, uh, then it, it, uh, it's not as effective at that stage. And also remember, Bt just lasts essentially a day or two at the most uh, in the environment. So if you spray today and something shows up tomorrow, it's probably not going to do much good, if any. All right, our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, a couple of things that uh, might be of interest. If you uh, have been thinking about uh, creating a commercial fruit, Orchard. There's a couple of programs uh, that AgriLife is offering. They're not in this area, but if you're talking about investing the significant amount of money it takes to create a horticultural operation of business, uh, it is well worth a drive uh, to go and learn. Uh, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 30, almost 34 years now, and I've been to a lot of sites where the, an orchard existed and there were problems, and oh my gosh, if they just called before they put the orchard in or if they, you know, got me involved earlier in the process, we could have helped them avoid a lot of things that waste money or, or maybe, in fact, make it where it's not going to be a productive and profitable enterprise. And so if you're thinking about becoming a vegetable gardener, if you're thinking about a Christmas tree grower, a fruit grower, I say vegetable gardener, vegetable producer, you know, small scale um, local producer uh, or fruit grower, or certainly pecan grower, give us a call and let us help direct things early on. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's kind of sad to see, uh, you know, a, um, a couple, a family, uh, you know, invest money in an enterprise and, and uh, that we've got the wonderful dreams of what we hope it is. And uh, that is just maybe not what they end up realizing uh, with a few mistakes early in the process. So enough about that. Let me tell you about the events. Okay, on September the 26th and 27th, over in New Braunfels, Texas, at the Civic Center, is the 11th Annual Texas Fruit Conference. Uh, AgriLife Extension puts that event on annually, and there are all kinds of activities going on over there. Lots of educational programming uh, that you can learn about. They have a Taste of Texas Fruit reception uh, also as part of the event and uh, you can meet fellow Texas fruit growers, kind of pick their brain, and eat some great fruit-centered foods, even sampling Texas wines. Uh, but that event is uh, on September 26th and 27th in New Braunfels, and you want to go ahead and, and register uh, for it. Uh, the cost of the, depending on what all you are going to do, like I mentioned, the fruit reception is, is an additional cost. But uh, if you are going to register in person, or rem if you want to attend remote online, it's $90 uh, per person. If you want to go to more of the events that are going on then, uh, it, the price goes up from that a little bit. You can, you can call 862-1218 for more information. That's 979-862-1218. And so if you are all at all thinking about doing commercial fruit production, please uh, spend a little bit ahead of time on that. And uh, I think you'll one or two things will happen. You'll realize either that it's not for you or you'll decide that it is for you, but you will be well on your way toward a successful operation uh, with that kind of information and, and the connections that you make. The second event is for olive growers. Uh, that is September 30th. Uh, September 30th, and it's basically all morning at the Extension Center in Uvalde. So there's a little bit of a drive out there. Uh, but the Extension Center in Uvalde uh, is going to be a half-day education program on commercial olive production. 
you can help, uh, it will help you if you're a prospective grower decide if olives are right for you because they're definitely not uh, right for everybody that's interested in fruit growing. And it will help, uh, if you're a current grower, it will help you understand ways to improve uh, your operation. There is also the ability to attend online. Uh, for more information, and here's a number, it is 361-649-8561. I'll give that again in just a moment. Uh, for an for to RSVP, if you want to attend, it's tx.ag tx.ag slash tx and then olive update o l i v e u p d a t e tx.ag slash tx olive update. The phone number again three six one six four nine eighty five. 61. There's lots of good information going on out there for those of you who might be interested in taking it to the next step. Well, let's go back to the phones. Again, the number 845-5689, and we're going to talk to Randy. Hello, Randy. Hey, Skip. How are you? I'm well. What's up? I want to ask you about um, transplanting. So I've done some rearranging on my landscape, and I have some leopard plants that I want to move. Okay. Uh, what would be the best time to move those the best time uh, you could do it in the spring or you could do it you know in the fall e either one just a little bit later in the fall D are, are yours in a pretty protected area? do they die back in the winter or do they keep going during the winter you know if it, it you know if it gets cold you know like blow freezing a little bit you know they'll they'll die back but they always come back really strong yeah um so yeah. i just wanted to kind of you know, I want to move a couple of them to another area because mm -hmm. I just change out some stuff. And so, yeah. um, you know, I thought about, you know, waiting that, to that time in the winter, you know, when they're, right. when they, you know, <laughs> right. all, all fold up because of the cold, you know, cold. But yeah, I, I think if they were mine, I'd probably wait until, you know, that they're sort of kind of getting, you can tell the cold is bugging them a little bit and they're not just real vigorous. Uh, and then go ahead and dig them and move them because it's easy to see right where they are. Uh, you yeah. know, because you can see everything sticking above ground. And then I would mulch the area well, just in case we get into another one of those, uh, God forbid, seven degree temperature days, uh, you right. know, just to give them a little extra protection. Uh, or you could do it in the in the springtime as early as, as you can get out there and get it done. I think it would be good. There, well, I'll tell you one thing. You're the one that turned me on to those because uh, they grow in the, uh, the shade. Yes. But I want to pass something on just in case anybody ever buys them. When I um, planted some, I planted them just, you know, flat level with the ground. The ones I did that to, I lost half of them. You know, I lost a couple of them. Okay. When I put a mound, when I built a mound up with, with you know, good soil, put them on top of that, like a little, just a little mound. Mm -hmm. Those all thrive. They never have a problem. So I think sometimes spring for systems tend to get a lot of water, maybe, and that they don't like that. Uh-huh. Uh, but when you make a mound, it has more room for that to roll off and not sit there and set on those roots. And it seemed all those are vigorous and they're fine. And the huh. ones I put on flat ground struggled. But well, anyway, that's that's good. That. That's good to know. Yeah, we, uh, you know, it, it it was hard to even talk about rain this year. But um, when it rain, yeah. when it rains, it pours. And here we are in the big middle of one of those. It's just like, oh my gosh, we're actually getting rain. Uh, exactly. And so anything that's a little bit intolerant of soggy soil, which is most plants, by the way, uh, it does benefit from getting its roots up out of the swamp. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I appreciate it. So I'll wait for those things to wither up a little bit for the winter, and I'll, I'll move them. All right. Well, good luck with those. They, those Thank are you. interesting plants. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, I love them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. we got time for another call. If it's a quick one, somebody wants to give us a call at 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, so we are, uh, we're looking now at uh, the return of a little bit milder temperatures and uh, some rainfall. Hopefully that will hold on. And we will discontinue. I, I just uh, would not be 100% sure that we won't go back into a little bit hotter weather and uh, maybe the rainfall not as plentiful. Uh, but 
either way, I think we've kind of rescued a lot of plants with this one, and it won't be as hard keeping up uh, going forward. Uh, you know, it takes it takes a pretty significant drought to really hurt some of our deeper um, or more extensively rooted plants that are more well adapted to our area, which of course not all plants are. Uh, and so, but we're going to just assume that we have kind of survived the worst, and now here we go into planting season. So, if you want to redo your flower beds, uh, this is a time to get that soil prepared better. Uh, anytime you build up a bed, you can buy a bed mix from a soil yard to drop on the soil and essentially drop a bed on the ground and, and there. Uh, I always mix the bed mix a little bit with the soil that's there, put maybe four inches down and mix it in and then add the rest of it. So you sort of create a more of an e even transition going from one type to, of soil to the native soil below. Uh, but it's not critical, but it, I think it does help. Uh, you can also just mix compost into the soil that you have and get ready for that. But getting the soil right first is important. Uh, we're at in the time when you need to hurry up and get in any warm season flowers you want to plant. That would be things like uh, uh, marigolds, which are beautiful. They simply glow in the cooler days of fall. And the spider mites that plague them in the hot weather, uh, by the time they get into fall, those are just shutting down due to the change in temperature and day, change in day length, uh, too. Uh, and so marigolds are great. Petunias would do well. The angelonias are going to keep going. Zinnias can still be planted, and, and you can grow some things there. So I, I would consider the warm season, like, get that done soon. Uh, then as we get into September, we start uh, getting making sure everything's ready because we're going to begin planting some cooler season flowers. Stock, uh, for example, would do well as it cools off a little bit uh, in the toward the end of the season. Uh, when it really cools off a lot, we get in later October uh, or on November, we, we look at things like pansies and violas that can go in. Uh, certainly the ornamental cabbages and kales could even go in back in September. So there's a lot of flower planting to do to give us color. There's no reason why we can't have color uh, during the cool season. One of my favorites that I haven't mentioned yet is dianthus. Uh, dianthus are beautiful, and they do so well here uh, for much of the cool season. Uh, and so the, I think that uh, it's time to celebrate the survival of summer with some color in the landscape, and these are some good ways uh, to do that. So I would encourage you to, to get out and, and get the soil right first. That is the foundation for success, or it's the cause of most failures when we don't do that prep. Uh, ahead of time. Well, thank you for listening today. We're always glad to have you join us for Garden Success. And, and please tell your friends and neighbors about it. If you got anybody that's interested in any way in gardening or just helping their yard uh, to be a little bit nicer, uh, that's what we're here for. And we look forward to talking to you again next Thursday. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.